Both homogeneity and isotropy are part of what we call the cosmological principle, but it's also kind of intuitive in a way, and it helps us. Another thing that it helps us with is the nature of our coordinate systems. Now, this is where we're starting to talk about what we really mean by the nature of space. Here's a metric space, meaning that each point in the space not only has a label x, y, z, or r, theta, phi, but also has some rule to measure the distance between the points. The labels make it clear that we're working in a three-dimensional space. This means to fully and exclusively parameterize every point in space, we only need three numbers. These numbers can be assigned to places on a grid. Now, the grid of coordinates is not unique. There is an infinite number of possibilities, but we will stick to orthonormal coordinate systems, even though that is not strictly necessary. By contrast, a non-metric space would not necessarily even have enumerated locations on some grid. It just might have some index or some non-numeric naming convention for each point in the space. Luckily, we won't need to learn any more about such spaces. It is the application of some parameterized coordinate system to the space that solidifies the concept of a metric space. Let's declare that one step equals one meter. We can also declare that we can make a curve that smoothly traverses between two locations, and that each point on that curve can be associated with some real number, not just integers. Measuring the length of that curve, whether it's a straight line or some bendy, loopy path, is facilitated by the thing called the metric. The metric transforms points in a space, each labeled with coordinates, into a distance between the endpoints of the curve. Again, the curve between two points can be called a path, and this path curve in a metric space has a parameter that, as we go from point to point, will translate the continuous smooth set of points on the curve into a distance. Of course, the most common system for labeling points in space, in a space, is the Cartesian coordinate system with orthogonal x, y, and z. We can also use a different kind of orthogonal coordinate system, the spherical coordinate system. Here we have a radial coordinate, which is some distance away from the arbitrary origin or zero point. Next is theta, which is an angle from the z-axis down to the radial coordinate. Finally, we have the phi coordinate, which is just like a longitude rotating around the xy plane. Now notice that the center or zero point or origin of the xyz system is arbitrary. That's a concept of a homogeneous space. We can set up our origin anywhere. As for isotropy, the exact direction of the z-axis is arbitrary. We'll call it up. But what exactly is up far away from a gravitational field? Thus, our orientation is also arbitrary, so therefore it's isotropic. It's easy to show that we can transform the Cartesian xyz into r theta phi. The dl of both these metrics is the distance between any two points in this metric space, and they are exactly the same distance. They only differ in their coordinate labels. Here we're only showing one point, but if we had two points, then their distance will be some distance change in x, some distance change in y, and some distance change in z, and that will give us the total distance change, which gives us a length between the two points. Importantly, a space doesn't care about what label it is. We use the most convenient label to solve whatever problem we have. Neither one is the one correct coordinate system. Also, the labels themselves therefore are arbitrary so long as they span the dimensionality of the space in question. The metric itself is also in a very real way independent of the coordinates. Its job is to translate coordinate differences into a distance. Let's now look at the difference between polar and spherical coordinates. Polar coordinates are just a different way to map points on a 2D surface. I won't use the word plane because that has a specific meaning, as detailed by Mr. Euclid way back in the day. Spherical coordinates are in three dimensions and cover a three surface. That's an ugly way of trying not to use the word space. In both cases, the choice of origin is arbitrary, and though the coordinate setup looks different in each, the two different pairs of coordinates, the xy in polar and the xyz in spherical, in each case, the surface or volume is fully spanned and labeled by the two coordinates or three, depending on the space's dimension. The 2D case does not necessarily need or rely on any aspect of a third dimension, and by extension, 
the 3D case does not need or rely on a fourth spatial dimension. In addition to spherical coordinates, we could use cylindrical coordinates. Basically, they're just polar planar coordinates with a z-axis sticking orthogonally up from the plane, so we have this very simply connected space and spaces. And these coordinate labeling things are giving you an implicit bias about how you think about space. We think that well, once you're out in space, there are no restrictions on your movements. And why not? I mean, there shouldn't be any, unless like you run into an asteroid or something, and unless you're writing some good sci-fi, you don't think of, say, going into space and all of a sudden hitting some wormhole or hitting some block in space or a boundary in space where you have to go around the boundary or you just can't go past a boundary in space. We don't think of space like that. We think of space as going on forever, just like Euclid said. And all these coordinate systems that we've been looking at support this common sense idea about space. Unfortunately for our common sense, there are an infinite number of spaces that are homogeneous and isotropic, and only exactly one of them abides by Euclid's axioms. To show what I mean, let's take this concept of a cylindrical coordinate system and play with it for a little bit.